You are listening to Time Out with Coach B. I'm Steve Bittison, or as my basketball players often call me, Coach B. As a basketball coach, I might call it Time Out for several different reasons. It might be to give instruction, correct a mistake, change the way we are playing, or simply to motivate us to play harder. Isn't that what God's Word does for us? 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that God's Word is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That is exactly what this ministry and podcast is all about. I believe we all need to take a time out occasionally to receive instruction, correct mistakes, change the way we are going, or get motivated to play the game of life God's way. Over the course of this summer's messages, we have been looking into the book of Acts, studying the first church, that church that was the most effective church in the history of the world. Our goal is to try to look past the way that we have been doing church for centuries and find out what God wants us to do right now in the 21st century. Whereas in the book of Acts, thousands were joining the church every time they turned around, today, thousands upon thousands of people are dropping out of church and countless others are only marginally attending. Why is that? What made that first church so different than the church today? Those are some of the answers that we are discovering in this series that we've titled, Doing Church a New Way. But in reality, it won't be a new way at all. We are looking at how that first church in the book of Acts did things. So take a time out away from your busy life and join me in week three of this summer series from the book of Acts. Today's message is titled, What Are You Devoted To? Hello and welcome back to our third week in our study of the book of Acts that we've called Doing Church a New Way. As you listen to this series, you will discover that we are not really looking to try to do church a brand new way. We're simply looking at how to do church that original way a way not really seen in a few thousand years. A way that moves away from the traditional model of church and looks at how that original church, the most effective church in the history of the world, did church. Last week we talked about how most churches today are centered inside the four walls of their church, meeting on a Sunday morning usually. Every ministry and everything they do came back to that Sunday morning service inside those four walls. And if a ministry does not directly correlate with those four walls, then they sometimes have little to do with it. The only exception may be being missions. If you missed that message, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. But as I promised last week, this week we're going to start looking at what that first church did. In its very infancy, when in one day, the church grew from 120 people to over 3,000. They had no church building that that would hold that many people. They did not have ushers and parking lot attendants to make sure that everyone got where they needed to go. They did not have a budget to print out that many bulletins and they did not have a wide variety of programs that were set up to meet the needs for over 3,000 people. And since many of those 3,000 also had children, I know that they did not have the nursery staff or children's church or the facilities to accommodate that kind of growth. But none of that was a problem because they did not do church according to the model that we have done for a few thousand years. Yes, I know our model has been tweaked from age to age and adapted here and there, but for centuries it's always been the same model. A model centered inside four walls and a Sunday morning church service. But that first church, the most dynamic and effective church in history, did church a different way. I want to propose right now that as we study this first church, we take a complete paradigm shift in our thinking as to how church was done back then. As I've said, today's model of church is the same model we've seen for centuries. It centers inside the four walls of the church and its Sunday morning service. Those four walls are the hub of the church and in some form or fashion, everything the church does either comes from the four walls and their worship service or it leads back to it. As I mentioned last week, even the small group that I had been a part of for so many years and had meant so much to me was bound by the four walls of that church. When I stopped going to those four walls and their Sunday services, I had to stop going to that small group. 
But I want to propose, and I think this first church that we are looking at in the book of Acts will show us that the church model we see today has it all backwards. The small groups were the hub of that first church. Everything stemmed from the small groups. Ministry stemmed from the small groups. Prayer stemmed from the small groups. Community stemmed from the small groups. I would go as far as to say that today, the Sunday morning services inside the four walls of a building should stem from the small groups, not the other way around. The bigger meetings, those things that we call Sunday morning services, should be nothing more than many small groups getting together corporately. Now I know to some that that sounds blasphemous. How dare I suggest that the Sunday morning church service within four walls of a building is not God's way of doing church. And that's okay for you to think that's strange and maybe even uncomfortable. Believe me, a year ago, I would have thought the same thing. But in my studies in the book of Acts, I begin to think differently. I only ask that you be open to this idea of doing church a new way instead of binding yourselves to a model that is a far cry from the one that we see happening in the book of Acts. And in so doing, perhaps the current church model can slowly start to morph into something closer to that of that first church. It won't happen all at once, but it will start when people like you and me start to change the way we are thinking in order to do what God originally called us to do. So let's look at the end of Acts chapter 2 in that very famous church verse, Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now stop. In this verse alone, we see four major things that the people of that first church devoted themselves to. The teachings of the apostles, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So let's take a few minutes to look at those four things to see what would actually what that would actually mean to us in the 21st century if we wanted to be like that first church. We're going to see several fascinating things today that actually steer us away from the model of the, tra of the traditional church that all churches, even those that call themselves contemporary churches, have become. Because you see, contemporary churches are nothing more than putting a new face, a new image, and perhaps some new music to an old model. It is still centered inside the four walls of a Sunday morning church service. But as we are going to see, the four walls of a church building never comes up of what made the early church the most effective and dynamic church in history. First, we see that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Now I know many pastors and churches across the world preach this to their congregation in a way that the people believe that they are to devote themselves to the teachings of the pastor. Now I'm not negating that there are many, many great pastors out there who preach the Word of God in a great way. Hey, I regularly listen to many podcasts from some of those great pastors of today. But I do not believe that this passage, when looked at in its entirety, is not really saying that they all devoted themselves to the teachings of their pastor. Let me try to explain by painting a picture for you. As we talked about already, the church in one day went from 120 people to over 3,000 people, and now there was no building large enough for them to meet in every Sunday morning. So there was no way that they all sat in front of Peter each week and listened to a sermon. Yet, isn't that the way of traditional church? We all go to a building and we sit in chairs, lined up in rows, facing a stage, and listen to the pastor teach us. Some of those pastors preach to 50 people, some to 500 people, and some to 5,000 people. And then there are group, uh, there's a group of growing numbers of churches whose one pastor preaches to four or five groups of 5,000 people each weekend. None of that was possible in that first century church when in one day they grew from 120 people to 3,000 people. If you want to go get technical about it, and I kind of do, this church did not have a pastor or any kind of staff. They only had the apostles who had walked with Jesus and had learned every day for three years from him. And then they had people who followed Jesus. So in this case, it was a no-brainer to listen to those people who had spent that much time with Jesus. And one careful note here, it was plural. They devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles, not just one apostle, 
It wasn't just Peter. All of the apostles had the responsibility of teaching the people. So be very leery of devoting yourself to the teaching of one man. Just be careful. That's all I'm going to say about that. They did this without the benefit of four walls and a Sunday morning service where everyone gathered together, whether it was in one service or in multiple services. So how did those men and women devote themselves to the apostles' teachings if they weren't sitting under their teaching each week in church? I mean, they didn't even have podcasts back then. How did they do it? Well, I believe it goes back to the idea that the four walls in the Sunday morning service was not the center or the hub of the church. We will see later in today's passage that the people met throughout the week in different places, in small groups. Now, quite probably, the 12 apostles each led some of those small groups. Therefore, the people who met with them could easily learn from them. I also believe that those people who learned directly from the apostles also probably met at other times with other people and passed those teachings on to them. You know, I guess the first church was actually probably the first multi-level marketing program in the history. Well, my goal is that by the time we get through these last verses of Acts chapter 2 today, you will see just how this multiple groups work together as a first church and how perhaps that might be, well, let me slow down here in trepidation, as I'm about to say something that will sound so foreign to the model of church that we've been, that's been around for centuries. So let me start that again. My goal is that by the time we get through these last verses of Acts chapter 2, that you will see just how church probably worked and how perhaps that might be, and here it comes, a better way of doing church than what we are currently doing. So to show you how this worked, let's move on. Verse 42 goes on to tell us that they devoted themselves to fellowship. Ah, fellowship. Though they may not use that actual word, what so many people are looking for in a church is a true and genuine sense of community, of deep friendship. We want to belong to something that is bigger than ourselves and we want to feel like others care about us. We want to be part of something and with people where when you are making your way in the world today, it takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Oh, wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. Church needs to be that place for people, not a bar in Boston named Cheers. I know, I just lost many of you right there. For those of you who are younger and, and those of you who didn't watch pop television several decades ago, those were the words to the theme song from a TV show that ran for years that all took place inside a bar in Boston named Cheers. The characters in that show all found community in a bar that everyone knew their name. Yet all too often, people don't find that true sense of community in their church. Oh, they may or may not find it in a bar, but, but you know, it's really sad that the old TV show Cheers that took place in a bar actually was maybe a better model of church than so many churches are today. We want community. We want fellowship. We need it. That first century church seemed to understand that. And you know, I think we would too today if we did not think of church as the four walls on a Sunday morning. Yet sometimes we get the idea of fellowship confused with the idea of traditional church. Many churches even have that word fellowship in their name. But does that mean that they are devoted to true fellowship because they call themselves a fellowship? You know, I used to go to a church that at the end of every service the pastor would say, stick around for some time of fellowship, it's the best thing we do. But did true fellowship really take place in those next five, maybe 10 minutes? Just calling something fellowship doesn't mean it is fellowship. Does visiting occasionally for five minutes before or after church constitute a devotion to fellowship? A devotion to it? Hardly. If we were really going to devote ourselves to fellowship the way the first church did, then we cannot look at church as a Sunday morning thing and think that our few minutes visiting with someone before the church service or after the church service constitutes a true devotion to fellowship. That is simply visiting with someone for a few minutes. Non-Christians do that every day at work. Now, 
We are going to see in the next few verses how this true idea of fellowship actually plays out. But before we do, let's move on and let's, let, let's try to define fellowship. The Greek word translated fellowship is the word koinonia. It means communion. Not really the word communion that we think of when we talk about taking communion at a church. But it does come from the same root word. It comes from the word that means common. And we'll see this in the next few verses, how that applies. Another way of defining it is a partnership. I've also heard fellowship defined as the expression of genuine Christianity among the members of God's family. Oh, I like that one. Because it carries with it things far deeper than five minutes worth of greeting on Sunday morning or going out for pizza together every once in a while. It doesn't even take place just because, here comes the surprise, we meet together on a semi-regular basis in a small group. That's a good start, but it's not automatic. It might be nothing more than just going through the motions. True fellowship can only take place when we step into the circle with each other, when we rejoice with those who rejoice, and when we hurt with those who hurt. It happens when being around each other automatically encourages us in our Christian walk. These are all things that simply cannot take place when church is centered inside the Sunday morning worship service. Something usually happens once people walk inside those four walls of the church. They put on their best Christian face and genuine relationships do not form there. That sense of community, of fellowship, even of friendship can only be formed outside the four walls of the church and outside of the Sunday morning worship service. This kind of fellowship can only be found within a ministry and community of a small group that meets regularly together. And it takes time. It takes time to truly start caring about the people in your group. It takes time to build that relationship where you truly rejoice when things are going great with someone and we cry with them when they are hurting. It takes time. But it's an investment of time that is well spent. Now let's move on. We really could stay on this topic of fellowship for the entire message. I bet we could stay on it for an entire series, but let's not do, the, do that today. Let's, let's continue in Acts chapter 2. In addition to devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, we are told in verse 42 that they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Now there are two ways of looking at this idea of breaking bread. First, we could look at it as simply eating together. Oh, growing up, the Baptists had this part down with their potluck dinners. And I guess there's something to say about eating together as it oftentimes over dinner that you can really start to get to know someone. And we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. But right now, I want to look at that second way that we could look at the idea of the breaking of bread. And that is communion or the Lord's Supper. It's one of those things that the church is told to do periodically to remember Christ's sacrifice by breaking bread, which is symbolic of his broken body on the cross. For this first church, the act of communion was not a ritual that they went through every so often. And depending on your church tradition, depends on how often you participated in communion. For some, it was once a quarter, for some monthly, for some weekly. But for most, it's probably become just a tradition or a ritual, something you just do. But for those people in the first church, it was something that they were devoted to. They were devoted to remembering the sacrifice of Christ. Unfortunately today in most churches, that time of focusing on Christ is directed by the pastor. He stands in front of the congregation and tells them what to think, what to think about, and what to do. When to eat the bread and when to drink the cup. And I guess that goes to the model that we use today that is more akin to the school setting, especially the old traditional ways of doing school where the teacher taught and the students listened. But you know, education is changing the way we educate our kids today. The big push in education is a learner-based model or project-based learning where the students learn to discover truths, not just be told what truth is. Education is changing, but the church isn't. Okay, I guess I digress. Let's get back to the breaking of bread. Since that first church had no church building and no pulpit and no chairs that people sat in while ushers passed out the elements, then I kind of think they did communion a different way. 
Now, growing up in the infancy of the church plant where my father was the pastor, we had a communion service once a month on a Sunday night. At that time, the church was small enough and we were renting a place with portable chairs. Each time we did communion, we sat in a big circle and people shared different thoughts before eating, and the bread, eating the bread and drinking the cup. At that time, the church was small enough that even though the circle was pretty large, it still worked. Unfortunately, they grew too big, got a permanent sanctuary, um, and that practice and now their communion service is like most other churches where ushers go row to row and pass out the elements while everyone listens to the person behind the pulpit. Now, as an adult, I was part of another church for over four years that probably tried to do communion closer to the way the first church did it than most other churches do. They served communion in what they called family style. A family would meet together and sometimes a few families would meet together and right there in different areas of the auditorium, they would partake of communion in their little circle of people. Well, to me, that makes it more possible to truly devote yourselves to it because you are not just listening to the pastor behind the pulpit. It gives you a better opportunity to engage in it. Now, I don't think their system was perfect, but because they, like most every other church in America, still practice the traditional church model of doing church within four walls on a Sunday morning, this was probably as close as they could come to doing it the way the first church did it, while still defining church as those four walls on a Sunday morning. I suggest, however, that it is far more effective and engaging if we would partake of communion in small groups where we could better share in our thoughts and remembrances of what Christ did. If you are part of a small group, try it sometime. See if it is more effective and more personal than doing it inside the four walls on a Sunday morning. And then we are told in verse 42 that they were devoted to prayer. Notice that the text does not say that they said a prayer during church. Now I know most every church prays a few times during each service, sometimes several times. Some pray during the singing portion of the service and then they pray before the pastor gives his sermon. They pray to close out the service. Great things. But don't think for a minute because someone stands in front of an audience and prays that that means that the church is devoted to prayer. It simply means that at periodic and planned times in the service, someone prays. They pray because the traditional church model says to pray at these times. So what does it mean for a church to devote itself to prayer? Can that devotion really be seen on a Sunday morning inside four walls of a church? How can we say a church is devoted to prayer when in reality is only a few people praying in front of everyone else? And that is where, once again, the concept of a small group comes into play. This is where you can really devote yourselves as a group to pray. It is much more intimate setting and gives you the opportunity to to really express your prayer requests and have people seriously pray for you and allows you to really pray for others. And since a small group is so much more intimate than a Sunday morning service inside the four walls of a church, thus allowing people to form closer relationships, it should mean that you care for people enough to where you pray for them throughout the week and maybe even check up on them from day to day. That is what it means to be devoted to prayer. It also helps it fellowship aspect of the church that way too. But let's move on um, or we'll be here all day. Verse 43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. I could really spark a bigger debate than I already have with just this verse alone. Different churches have different beliefs and different traditions as to what it means to perform signs and wonders. But my intention is not to start an argument or to turn off people from one side or another as to what I believe or what they believe about signs and wonders. So I don't want to focus on what those signs and wonders were or what they might be today. Instead, I want to focus on the first part of that verse. Whereas signs and wonders could be defined by different groups in different ways, I don't believe there is much argument on what the word awe means. Because of what was going on with that church, the signs and wonders performed by the apostles, whatever that might mean, the people had an incredible sense of awe. What they saw going around them was awesome. Well, let's face it, in one day the church grew from 120 people to 3,000 people. That in itself is incredible and it had to fill everyone with awe who saw God, who saw God moving in such a way. 
Well, we will see in, in a few verses that the church growth did not stop with those 3,000 people. We will see that every day people were coming to know Christ and the church was growing at an incredible rate. How many of our churches today can boast of the fact that through their ministry, people were coming to know the Lord every day? Oh, a few churches can say that most every Sunday they see someone come to Christ, and that usually happens in the very large churches. But if we would break away from the church model that we have practiced for centuries and embrace what the first church was actually doing, then I believe we would again have the effect on our communities that the first church had on theirs. If we would be the church in the public places where the world can see the love and commitment we have and we would be the church in the small intimate settings where relationships are formed and a sense of community and fellowship abounds, then we will see awe some things that God will do in our midst. But it all starts with a paradigm shift that quite frankly, I'm afraid that most churches are afraid to make. We must make the home ministry, the small groups, the hub of the church. Make that the entry point into the church because that is where true community happens. That is where true prayer happens. That is where discipleship begins. And from the small setting, we can then celebrate in large groups. But right now, most churches are like the tail wagging the dog. You come to our four walls on Sunday morning, and then from there, we want to plug you into small groups or perhaps a Sunday school class. But the first church model was the reverse. It starts in the small groups and then unites in a bigger sense. If we were to operate that way today, then small groups would, would not be a ministry of the four walls on a Sunday morning model, but those Sunday morning worship times would be the ministry of several small groups coming together. Do you see the difference? Now at this point in my life, I'm not in a small group anymore, and I miss that very much. And I hope to one day soon be a part of a small group again. But when I do, it will be one that is based on the Acts chapter 2 model and not a modern church model. In closing, I want to acknowledge that I know I probably turned off some of you because you believe I am teaching against the church. Please, please understand that I'm not anti-church. I still go to church each week. I still love the church. But I want more than anything else for the church is for it to realize that it is following a model that is not biblical. If the church realizes that fact but doesn't know how to change it, then that's one thing. But to stubbornly believe that the modern model of church is how they did church in the book of Acts, well, that's just plain, well, being stubborn and perhaps lazy, maybe even selfish, because it doesn't want to change. So today, I call on many of you to rise above the traditions of the current model and embrace a new way of doing church. No, no, no. Embrace the original way of doing church. How that will all play out and work out, we will be looking at over the next several weeks as we continue examining the first church of the book of Acts. I think if you stay with us, you will be pleased and perhaps even excited as to what church could actually look like and be. So let me ask you about your views of church. Today we examined the end of Acts chapter 2 and saw several things that that first church devoted itself to. Are you devoted to these same things? I know in the current model of doing church, it doesn't look exactly like that first church, but in your own way, in the way that fits into the current church model, though I pray that all that it begins to change, but for now, as far as you know how to be, are you devoted to it? Are you devoted to the teachings of the Bible? to prayer, to fellowship, to truly focusing on what Christ has done and is doing for us? Do you know enough about what God is doing in the midst of your church fellowship that you are filled with awe? If you cannot answer yes to all these things, then perhaps it's time for you to start thinking about doing church a new way. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. I pray that you are being blessed by this ministry. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email me at coachbittison at aol.com or visit our website at www.timeoutwithcoachb.wordpress.com. Join us next week for the fourth week in our summer series, Doing Church a New Way. 
we will be looking at Acts chapter 3 in hopes of answering the question why so many people are leaving the church today or only marginally attending. You won't want to miss it. Until then, may God surround you with his love, fill you with his grace, and capture your heart.